One of, one of my favorite philosophers is Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, who has the line that for he who is a why, he can bear almost any how. Um, and the same principle applies in reverse, is that for he who has no why, there is no how that is of use. Um, and so this is where it comes down to you have to have your, your relevant why. Hey everyone, my name is Connor Devine and you are watching Money and Plants. This is a very special episode of the show. This is the 50th, 50th episode of Money and Plants, a project that I started about two years ago, um, just whenever COVID was starting to hit and people were being locked up in their houses and wondering what they were going to do, spend their time doing. And I decided to start a podcast. And I suppose there's two big passions that uh, in my life that I'm really curious and interested and passionate about, and that is this whole topic of financial literacy and money and finance. It's a it's a very bespoke sort of area steeped in mystery, and I've been very fortunate in my business career that I've been able to figure a lot of things out in that area, and I'm just really passionate about inequality and trying to educate people around money and finance and and help them understand some of these things. So I thought that was a really good topic um, to cover in my podcast. And then the total opposite to that is I'm interested in all things health. Uh, for someone who's still going through this sort of health transformation, this healing journey, I was diagnosed with MS in 2007 and spent five or six years really struggling to cope with that and all of the different things that was going on in my body neurologically. Um, I had lots of problems that I've been very open about and I've written about and I've blogged about um, over many years. So from the podcast perspective, I was really interested to try and bring those two totally different topics, money and finance, and then health together into one show, aka Money and Plants. So for episode number 50, I was really pleased when I was able to switch the dial from last week's show and talk about health-related matters. So in this episode, I talk about heart disease and cardiovascular disease. So heart disease kills 17 million people every single year, okay? That is a pandemic. It's a major, major problem. In Ireland, over 300,000 kids are diagnosed with heart disease and are overweight. 300,000 kids, one in five of our children are either overweight or obese. For adults, the figure goes up to 60%. So I'm interested in finding a little bit more out about heart disease, about how we can prevent heart disease, what is heart disease, and what things can we do then to try and change or prevent the onset of heart disease. Is heart disease inevitable? In this conversation, you're going to find out a little bit more about that. Who am I speaking to? I'm talking to Ireland's number one preventative cardiologist, Dr. Paddy Barrett. I've only came across his work in the last month or two. An amazing cardiologist. Check his Twitter page out. Check out his YouTube channel. But in this conversation, I talked to Patty about everything which involves heart disease, cardiovascular disease, messaging at a policy level, at a government level, educationally. What can we do more to try and encourage people to take back control of their health? How can we help people understand heart disease? How can we help people understand what they can do to fix and prevent the onset of heart disease? All of that and much, much more in this conversation with Dr. Patty Barrett, let's roll the tip. Dr. Patty Barrett, you're really welcome to Money and Plants. How are you keeping? How is your Monday? We're recording on Monday afternoon. How are you feeling? All very good, very good. Uh, we're still here. That's all we can hope for. Indeed. So look, I came across your work only in the last while. And as I was saying to you before we had record, I've, I've, I've always struggled sort of to come across um, an Irish physician consultant who talks very openly, has, has a very good online presence, is very informative, good to camera, um, 
fill you with compliments uh, as we go. But I want to ask you and start. Why do you think that is? Like, why do you think we don't see more people in medicine and um, uh, physicians like yourself do more social media stuff? Because it's really, really powerful and impactful. Um, I, I think it really depends on the jurisdiction that you're looking at. Um, certainly in other countries and even within Ireland, there are people and physicians who are very vocal um, on either social media or various different uh, educational platforms. Um, for me, I've been uh, an active user of, say, Twitter for, for over 10 years. Um, I was on Twitter before it was uh, cool to be on Twitter, um, and no one really understood what it was. Um, and that was really, that grew out of the idea of being able to be part of a conversation with domain experts from all over the world in your respective area. And I still use it on a daily basis to keep up to speed with scientific knowledge, et cetera. So it's it's one of my best sources of information. And then it's just really about giving back to that community. Excellent. And you're the third cardiologist that I've had on Money and Plants. I'm obviously incredibly passionate about health. And I think in this conversation, I, I wanted to try and sort of get as much information across and as simple across to the listeners in terms of things that they might be able to do to improve their own cardiovascular, their own heart health. First question before we get into it is, what sort of drew you to cardiology and and the health of the heart? Like, was that always your focus? Did you always want to be a consultant or what was your, where did your motivation come from? Um, I think it's always hard to explain things, uh, you know, thinking about why you went into something a lot of things don't make sense originally when you do it but in retrospect um uh, when you look back um it all begins to make sense um intuitively it's a natural blend between kind of science and working with people um there's you know a very kind of interesting cross section between those two areas it's an area that continuously changes um so you always have to uh, evolve your knowledge base and that's kind of an interesting and exciting area um and it's it's a bit of the red queen from alice in wonderland problem uh, insofar as that in this world if you're not running at foot you have to run at full speed just to stand still um so that means <clears throat> everything is changing all the time and you have to change with it um and that just really kind of drew me toward it um my original uh i think forays into cardiovascular medicine had been at the very sharp end of the stick in insofar as working in interventional cardiology people presenting dramatically with heart attacks etc um and that's a very rewarding field to be into but with when you spend some time in that area you realize that the people who had actually arrived um to your care um you had missed the opportunity to intervene on those patients years if not decades prior um, and the literature bears that out insofar as that if you want to make the biggest bang for buck difference in terms of cardiovascular health, you need to be starting decades prior, not just days, weeks or months, but decades prior. So in order to make that biggest difference for my patients, um, and uh, I fundamentally changed my practice to more preventative cardiology to ultimately make that difference with my patients. And that's where I find myself today. And in preparation for this uh, discussion, one in five Irish children uh, are obese. Um, 300 odd thousand is the, the data that I was able to pull out over the weekend. It's saying ov- over 60% uh, of Irish people today are overbese or, or overweight. And typically, is that people who are obese or overweight, all of those, so you, you, you don't see thin patients. Is, is that right? Or is that totally stereotypically wrong? I mean, does heart disease only manifest in people who are obese or overweight? Uh, absolutely not. Um, so th- the reality is is that obesity is a marker of metabolic dysfunction. Um, so when you actually look at how you metabolize fuels, et cetera, um, and that is very common in people who are overweight or obese, um, but is very common in people who are of normal weight. Um, and so this is what we call the kind of tin on the kind of outside but fat on the inside. Um, and this is uh, incredibly common. Um, there's many, many different factors. It comes down to how you store different areas of fat um, and where you store it. But when we look at this idea of the, I suppose, shocking statistics re- with respect to Ireland's and globally um, overweight obesity statistics, this is really a function of a breakdown in our environment that we spend our time in. Um, this is not down to lack of willpower or motivation. Um, this is a function of, as Charlie Munger describes, it's show me the incentive and I will show you the outcome. Um, we have changed our environment around us to highly incentivize us um, to make all the wrong decisions when it comes to our nutrition, our exercise, our sleep, our cognitive well-being, etc. Um, and so the, the natural default state is to actually make the wrong decisions. 
for all of these things because of the environments that we spend our time in. Now, ultimately, that comes to the conclusion that for a lot of people will say that ultimately then it's not your fault. And I think in a lot of ways, it maybe is not your fault, but it certainly is your problem and you're going to pay the, the price for it. So it's incumbent on all of us then to kind of recognize where we're falling down or where other people might be incentivized to make poor decisions and help them correct a uh, course on that, uh, on that path. I think it's really difficult um, just being realistic about, I had uh, Ben Hunt on the podcast last week. I think Ben's one of the most critical thinkers in the US right now. And we weren't talking about health. We were talking about big tech, big media, big pharma, big politics, and the influence of the messaging um, on, on society right now. And it, it really it really does annoy me, actually, you know, the, the amount of promotion that we put into fast food and McDonald's and others. And I'm not having to go at any particular brands here. But I think if you're just, you know, it's hard enough to survive today. Life is very busy for parents, for all of us. It's really, really difficult. And I think most people just, you know, it's out of convenience. So we're, we're, we're seeing these messages on, on our Twitter feeds and on Facebook um, and on our television screens. And it's, it seems to be like good fun. Now we'll, we'll go and we'll have a, a big night or we'll do whatever. How do you think we change that? Because I don't see society changing until we try and change the messaging. If we don't change the messaging, I I just think it's status quo into infinity. What's your thoughts around that? It has to be a policy change. Um, It it has to be around, I mean, we can't tell people that they should cycle more when we don't provide them the infrastructure around uh, adequate cycling lanes and uh, cycling infrastructure. Um, We can't tell people that they need to eat healthily all the time when we have structured our modern food environment um, from either a kind of taxation of sugars or various different uh, fast foods and processed foods uh, to enable them to be easily sold. we have to create um, home environments whereby people have the time to actually sleep properly to make the right decisions um, and to be able to prepare their own kind of food. Um, if you look at it in, in order to, to make all the right decisions with respect to nutrition, sleep, stress, uh, exercise, etc., you have to work incredibly hard. And most people will tell you that they, they, they don't have the time. And while that is true, um, one of the, the phrases that I use is physiology doesn't care about your schedule. Um, and I struggle with this all of the time. And the, the reality is, is all of us have to work so hard just to actually do what would be considered the baseline. Um, so to correct that, you know, there needs to be a, a whole societal shift around this. And I think up to now, you know, we were willing to pay that price as a society, um, but that price is being paid by so many at such a level, at such a cost, that I don't think we have any other choice but to actually make the changes necessary. It's a thing I would, an observation I would make about, say, yourself and your career choice in cardiology. You're, you're seeing patients every day who are suffering at the, at the hands of, of heart disease. So you, you, you're getting reminded every day in your brain Look what happens if you don't do X, Y, and Z. For somebody like me who's recovering from um, MS and now doing incredibly well, my message whenever I go out to speak to people, speak to schools, whatever I'm doing, is, you know, don't be like me. Don't wait till something happens before you change. Make the change now. And I think I think that's an advantage that you and I have is because we've, we, we you see people who present and I have went through a health challenge. So I, I would suggest it's slightly easier, you know, for us to then think about a new way of living, a new lifestyle, a new way of, of, of moving around. Would you, would you agree with that? Like it is difficult until something personally happens to you or you see it all the time? Well, so this is one, one of my favorite philosophers is Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, who has the line that for he who is a why, he can bear almost any how. Um, and the same principle applies in reverse, is that for he who has no why, there is no how that is of use. Um, and so this is where it comes down to you have to have your your relevant why. Now, this also means that you have to meet people where they are. Um, so for somebody who is trying to, say, stop smoking, um, it's hard for them to internalize the fact that their risk really is going to manifest in terms of early heart disease, early cancer, etc. And so it's hard for them to stop. But I've routinely seen people who have had heart attacks who are smokers and stop cold on day one of their heart attack. So all of a sudden is that their incentive structure just changed hugely around them. Their, their why became enormous and became very clear. Um, but the problem is, is that as much as it frustrates us, data doesn't change our mind as much as we would like it to. Um, when we present statistics around coronary artery disease, uh, risk factors for coronary artery disease, take your pick, 
we're, we all pay attention, but often we don't change. And so that's around creating a story. And so narratives change people's minds. We're story-based creatures. So it's how we map those statistics onto stories, or we create more compelling incentives, similar to how we look at how we're going to fix climate change and, and say the use of electric cars, for example. We can't, we can't incentivize people to make better decisions if they're not the more preferable decision. So people, people buy Teslas because they want a Tesla, not because they actually want to be campaign warriors for, for climate change. And we need to make those incentives better for, for all of the, the core things that we talk about. So you sort of touched on, so whenever you see a patient for the first time or a second time, or maybe they're with you for three, six, nine, 12 months, have you noticed this, that um, whenever I spoke to, to Ben Hunt last week, he talked about identity and the previous doctor that I had on, Jeffrey Rediger, talked about whenever he wrote his book Cured, where he had 120 patients who had done to experience spontaneous healing. Part of that process of healing and recovery and that journey was identity and identifying as someone who wants to get better, who wants to actually, you know, you talk about incentives. Is that something, you know, whenever you see a patient, can you sometimes tell, say, this is going to be difficult for this person? Or, or do you, can you sense how a person's recovery or, or experience might be when, when you meet them the first or second time? So, I mean, Carl Jung describes that the greatest privilege of life is to become who you are. Um, and so for most people, they have to recognize who they are. And if they don't see themselves as somebody who is a person who, say, doesn't exercise or who doesn't stop smoking cigarettes or who, who doesn't eat in such a way, it's very hard for them to achieve those goals. So even though they, they know on a, on a very rational level that they, they should be exercising more, um, they, they find it very hard then to kind of map it onto their own personality. Um, and their their activities. And so you have to understand in terms of who they are, in terms of what their identities, so where their levers are that you can potentially make a change. For example, I had a, a, a woman who used to smoke cigarettes and she knew she needed to stop. She knew it increased her risk of cardiovascular disease cancer. Every patient knows that. So I made a deal with her that she could continue smoking on one condition. And that was that any cigarettes she smoked, she had to smoke in front of her grandchildren. And she just found this impossible because her grandchildren would get very upset with her when she smoked in front of them. Um, so she, she just couldn't bring herself to do that. Now, when she put that condition on herself, her, her smoking obviously decreased significantly. But again, it's about why would she want to stop smoking? Um, and it was to do with spending more quality time with her grandchildren. It wasn't really about the idea of reducing her chances of cancer or cardiovascular disease. She knew those things, but they were so far off in the future, it's very hard for her to make those tangible. And we know this from neuroimaging research, that if you think of yourself um, and you think of yourself tomorrow where something bad is going to happen, you have a lot of empathy with that person and a lot of motivation to make any changes to actually alter the outcome. But the further into the future that you think of yourself, the more it relates to in, in brain areas and neuroimaging of that of a stranger. So this is, this is then the kind of the bad outcomes are actually happening to someone in the future. Um, and the person that I like to quote here is also one of my favorite philosophers is Homer Simpson, when he was drinking a pint glass of vodka and mayonnaise and his wife Marge said not to drink it uh, because it would make him sick. And he said, that's a problem for future Homer. I hate to be that guy. And the reality is, is so many, so many of our, our future states in adverse health outcomes are, are future strangers to us. Um, and so it's hard for us to make the changes now um, to affect changes for that, that stranger for almost in the future. It seems it's a brilliant, uh, it's a brilliant example that you used there, but it does seem my experience of, of living to date is that we are wired to not worry about what happens down the road. You know, we're, we're, we're nearly the brain's wired for whatever reason, because if it was wired differently, you wouldn't do things that you knew made you sick. So to me, that, 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 that seems reasonable and rational. Would you agree? Well, I, I, think, I think historically, we were much more concerned with our immediate environment and our immediate threats. Um, and it's just very hard for us to, to future plan uh, to such a distant time in the future. Um, so it's, it's, it's an incredible challenge. But if you're going to do that, you need to have a why. You need to have a why that aligns with your values um, and the core identity of who you were about. Um, and so, you know, I think, again, you know, going back to that why, it's with, without a why, there is no how. And so you have to ask, why is it that you're making these changes? Because ultimately, 
when we look at it in terms of people will will live as long as they do and will have their health span or their their functional ability for as long as they do. Um, but it will eventually terminate. All lives eventually terminate. So the question is, is what are you going to do at that time? And how are you going to devote your time, purpose and meaning um, over those healthy years? Because it will come to an end. No one gets out of this alive. And so how are you going to spend your time? And you're going to spend it with, with good health um, and as long as possible. And that should be your motivation for, for many people. But in truth, most of us deny the fact that we're even going to die at some point in our life. Um, most of us believe that we will achieve immortality, either in a literal sense through either a religion and an afterlife or a rebirth, or in some kind of symbolic sense that we will, we will do something, either leave a legacy behind us in terms of children, a business success, money, architecture, painting, take your pick. Um, so in some sense, we're, we're all ach- trying to achieve immortality in that sense. And we feel that we will live on forever. I think so. I mean, I haven't, uh, I've, I have a pretty big sort of network myself and none of my friends have said to me, you know, when do you think you're going to die? It's not something that you sort of jovially talk about. We actually, we, we probably don't even go there ever until you're maybe very sick or you're, or you're later on in life. But the other thing I wanted to ask you about um, heart disease and coronary heart disease was as part of my own sort of healing journey, um, it took me to discover the work of Dan Buter and, and the Blue Zones and where most of uh, the world's centenarians seem to populate. So the question then is, is heart disease inevitable for everyone? Um, will all of us, regardless of, of whether you're a centenarian or not, at some point develop heart disease? And if, if it is inevitable, is it then a case of just putting it off for as long as possible? So if you look at the, the literature on healthy centenarians, the key thing to look at is that for most adults in the developed world, most adults will die from one of three things, particularly if you're a non-smoker. You're going to die from cardiovascular disease, cancer, or dementia. Now, if you look at the healthy centenarians and you ask, how is it that they die? They don't die from skydiving accidents or in their last ascent of K2. They actually die from pretty much the same thing as everybody else. They die from cardiovascular disease, cancer, and dementia. The key difference between us and them is that they get those conditions approximately 20 to 25 years later than everybody Mm -hmm. else. So most people, if given a long enough time horizon, almost certainly will develop significant coronary artery disease, which will result in a cardiovascular complication. Given a long enough time horizon, you could reasonably expect that everyone will develop some form of cancer or some form of cognitive decline. So we never, in a sense, prevent them in their entirety. We delay their onset as long as possible. And then almost certainly something else will take our lives. So when we look at this, this is a crucially important distinction. Those healthy centenarians typically have gene variants that actually delay the onset of those three key conditions. And so our goal then should be understanding how we can change the risk factors that lead to the onset of those conditions. Mm -hmm. And so if you focus just on cardiovascular disease, you find that the risk factors for those other conditions in terms of a whole variety of different cancers and also uh, dementias, actually there is significant overlap. So if you try and optimize your cardiovascular risk profile, you're likely to de-risk yourself on a probabilistic basis for those other two conditions also. Um, And that is why when we look at something like activity and exercise over a lifetime, not only does it delay or decrease the onset of cardiovascular disease, it actually decreases your chances of dying from anything significantly. So uh, this is why risk factor control before you develop a condition is so crucial to delay the onset, as opposed to waiting until you reach a point where you're diagnosed with a medical condition, and then you have to work way harder to try and reverse it or roll things back. And you're already way behind the power curve at that point. And that's something that I'm really passionate about because you're talking about risk factors and risk factors will depend on the environment that each of us keep. The, the problem I have then is that, you know, back to a policy level, not a political level, the messaging around this is non-existent because unless you figure this stuff out yourself, I, the path that I'm now on in, in my life, I wasn't always on this lifestyle path. But unless you figure out it yourself, then you're, 
how, how are you going to figure it out unless something happens? You need to decide to change. So politically, the messaging, educationally, in our schools, in our hospitals, in our canteens. I mean, this this bad food, bad habits is it's very hard to avoid, Paddy. So the the whole idea here is is it shouldn't be about getting information to everyone so that they can figure it out by themselves. The reality is is the environment that they spend their time in should naturally um, align with making the right decisions. Um, again, it's show me the incentive and I will show you the outcome. Um, yeah. When you give people incentives, like in Amsterdam, uh, insofar as that, that cycling is, is just a way that everyone moves around the city and it's a mode of transport, you don't need to tell people to, to move more during the day, to operate more in a zone one, zone two protocol so that you can actually get those exercise minutes up in those zones. Um, you know, so if you're just telling people to, to be more active, and I think if you can change that at a at a societal level, you make a huge difference. And you don't need to go mm-hmm. telling people that they need to be more active. It's automatically built into it. If you give people the, the better opportunities to, to eat real foods that are mm-hmm. low in kind of processing and also in refined sugars, they don't have to think about trying to eat healthy. We shouldn't have to be working this hard to make the right choices. And that is just a function of the environment that we spend ourselves, spend our time in. The reality, though, is, is that some people do recognize that they're being incentivized in all the wrong way. And they have to work very hard at actually trying to educate yeah. themselves and then working very hard at understanding their risk factor profiles and de-risking themselves over time. OK, this might seem like an obvious question, but what, what sort of symptoms, whenever you see a patient for the first or second time um, uh, and just what you said a number of minutes ago, you don't have to be obese or overweight to have heart disease. But what sort of symptoms would you would you see initially? What should people be looking out for if they're suffering from heart disease or coronary artery disease? So my first answer to that question is always the same, is that you should never be looking for symptoms. If you're waiting for symptoms, you are way, way, way too late. So the reality is, is that there are biomarkers that can tell you with fairly high confidence your risk of something decades in advance before you ever reach a point that you're developing symptoms. And unfortunately, for many people, their first presentation with coronary artery disease is sudden cardiac death. So yes, certain patients present with chest pain or shortness of breath. But if you've reached a point where that symptom is related to coronary artery disease, you have a very significant burden of coronary artery disease, and you're already significantly progressed along that pathway. Now, I don't say that to to, to scare anyone, but what I say is, is that you can't rely on symptoms. You have to rely on biomarkers. You have to say, am I doing 150 minutes approximately of moderate to vigorous activity a week at a minimum, in addition to two strength training exercises and getting eight hours of sleep and eating kind of a nutritious diet that is mostly whole foods, to actually keep my waist circumference within a certain range. And they, they're hard. You might say, well, you know, I don't have time, but physiology doesn't care about your schedule. Is my lip- lipid profile intact? Is, is it genetically predispositioned to give me a risk for early coronary artery disease? What is my blood pressure doing? Is it at target? Do I have diabetes? These are markers that you can see that define your risk decades in advance. So you're talking about, I have been fortunate enough to, to get uh, uh, the Randox every day, uh, sort of test 142 biomarkers. It's not overly expensive, but I do it every two or three years. But surely uh, I wanted to ask you a, qu- a question about digital technology. I just don't see, I don't think that we're there yet in terms of the, you know, people will number one, understand the biomarkers and then, you know, what they should look. I don't think we're there as a society yet. I don't, I don't see people being aware of that. None of my 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 uh, siblings or our network or colleagues, you, you just present whenever you're sick or too late. But but it's exciting whenever I hear you talking about that because I know that we have all that kind of technology. We have all of those things because it's not overly complicated. Um, would, you, would you agree with me though in, in what I've just said and that you, you, you are sort of making it sort of, you know, people should know, you know, your sleep, your, your, your food, your all the bits and pieces. Do you think people are really thinking about that as they go about their daily lives? I, I think often they don't buy into it and they don't believe that it has the power that it does. Um, we know with, with a fairly yeah. high degree of confidence over kind of significant longitudinal data sets that if you can maintain your weight, be active on a regular basis, don't smoke, 
um, you know, maintain kind of, a, you know, a regular kind of activities and not be hypertensive or have high glucose, you can add about 10 years to your life. Um, now, 10 years as a percentage of your life is an incredibly long period of time. Yeah. And this is, if you look at the impact that, that, that modern medicine can do from a therapeutic perspective, there is nothing that modern medicine can do that can really make you live 10 years longer. Unless, of course, no. you're having a sudden kind of acute event that saved yeah. your life and you were bleeding out or something. Yeah. But for the most part, this, this is how we extend human lifespan uh, significantly. Um, and I'm not talking about living to 125 years of age. No. I'm talking about having everyone live with a healthy lifespan, with their functional capacities intact, easily into their 80s and sometimes 90s. So the question always has to be what's called squaring the curve. It's how are you going to improve your lifespan and your health span? So how do you live a long as life with your health span in terms of the ability to think and do as much as you can over that time period? And so that's always the goal. And so the, the, the kind of the, the line that is thrown out in the, the centenarian community is they all want to live to 100 and die by being shot in the back by a jealous lover. So ultimately, that means you've lived a long life and even be, been able to up to those final years, being able to do the things that you're able to do. And so that's what's called morbidity compression, where you compress all the sickness in your life into a very short period of time, into a very yeah. short window. But what we're seeing now is, is people developing chronic diseases at earlier and earlier time yeah. points in their life. And so they're actually having you know, a morbidity extension. Yeah. So they're having decades and decades of chronic illnesses. So we're sicker for longer. We're getting sicker earlier and it's lasting longer. I totally get it. And that's some amazing information there. Very quickly before you go, talk to me about digital, medical, digital technology and why is it important? So I think everyone gets a little bit, uh, I think, caught in the, in the hype of some of the more novel biomarkers that you can, you can track. But there's huge utility in simply checking you know, your activity and having someone have you align with that in terms of holding you accountable. Are you hitting your minutes in terms of 150 minutes minimum activity uh, uh, minutes per week on a, on a moderate to vigorous activity basis? Are you hitting your sleep targets? You know, are you legitimately in bed for long enough? Um, and if you, if you don't get sleep right, everything else falls to pieces. Yeah. Um, simple things like when we talk about digital health, it doesn't have to be measuring the most advanced biomarkers. Remember, biomarkers include blood pressure. What is your blood pressure? So, you know, in terms of most people can't answer that, or most people will say, well, oh, it's roughly normal. But, but, but get a biomarker test in terms of use kind of these technologies that are available for very cheap price points now. And so if you know legitimately what your activity is, legitimately what your sleep is, legitimately what your weight is and what that trend over time is, legitimately what your blood pressure is, and to get a simple set of blood tests, um, you're way ahead of the curve. And if you can optimize those from as early as possible for as long as possible, you increase your chances significantly of, of living as long as possible for as healthy as possible. Absolutely brilliant. So, Paddy, just to finish off then, you think that, and you're saying that the data would back this up, that if people do take back control of their own health, if they start paying attention, if they look at the biomarkers around sleep, nutrition, what was the other biomarkers that you said there that's in our control? So it's, it's going to be kind of the, the, the four core pillars of exercise, nutrition, sleep, and stress. And then you have to think about any other exogenous uh, drugs, for example, or supplements you would use. So if people start to understand, start to look into those four main pillars that they can and they will extend their life if they make the appropriate changes. That's what, you, that's what you're saying. Remember, everything's a probabilistic bet. You work in finance. There are no guarantees. All you can do is set up probabilities. So we know that anything is possible. We could be hit by an asteroid right now. That is possible, just highly improbable. And, but we know that if you set up your life insofar as that you're hitting your appropriate targets from those four core pillars that we talked about, you increase substantially your chances of living longer. And yes, you could be hit by lightning. Yes, you could be hit, killed in a plane crash or a car crash. But all things being held equal you increase your chances of living longer with a higher health span than someone who doesn't. And all we can ever do is try and set up the odds as best as possible to do that. 
Final question for someone listening or watching who just thinks that they can't do this. There's no point. It's too late. They're too old or they're too far gone or whatever. If you make these changes in your life, how quickly then do you think the body will react to that? Is it possible to come back from, you know, a, a very difficult scenario? Have you seen this with your own patients who have maybe given up and then they've implemented changes? Is it a month, six months, 12 months? What's possible for people who've maybe given up? There, there's always goals that you can hit. There's always improvements that you can make, no matter what happens. And the reality is, is how quick can the differences be made? Almost immediately. And I don't say that in some form of quixotic fashion. The reality is, is if you have changed your mindset so that you know that you can do these things and you are fully focused on achieving them, your perspective on the world will change. And so therefore, your quality of life, your cognitive well-being, your mental health will change with it. You may not have made the, the practical changes just yet, but your perspective and outlook will change. Um, and in that sense, you can change immediately. Outstanding. Where can people find you, Paddy? Where's the best place? You've got a YouTube channel, you're on Twitter, Twittering all the time. Where's the best place? Easiest place is on Twitter. You just type my name into Twitter, or if you want to sign up to my weekly uh, newsletter on Substack, just type in Dr. Paddy Barr, Substack, and uh, the Google will take you there. Dr. Paddy Barr from Dublin, absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much for coming on to Money and Plants. Thanks so much. Hey everyone, welcome back. That was a really amazing conversation that I had with Dr. Paddy Barrett last week of the Black Rock Clinic in Dublin. I suppose heart disease and cardiology, um, the killer of 17 million people every single year, uh, the number one killer uh, in the world. And yet and all, it's a topic, a subject matter that you don't really hear anybody talking about it until you hear someone who is unfortunate enough to experience a cardiac arrest or a heart attack or is suffering from heart disease. So I just thought it was a really important topic that I cover on Money and Plants and because I've got access to people like Paddy Barrett. And just, just a word on Paddy. I mean, in terms of his ability to communicate, he is an excellent communicator, outstanding information, an incredible resource. And all of this information is free. If you want to follow Paddy, go and follow him on LinkedIn and Twitter in particular and also on Instagram. He's putting content out every single day, all of the stuff that we covered in the podcast and much, much more. Just some notes that I made on that conversation with Patty. There was so much content in there and I, I just hope that you guys get some value from it and maybe you use some of this information to talk to maybe your, your family, your loved ones, your network. If you're out at the weekend at the bar, you have a chat about the podcast and, and health and the role of changing your environment and changing your mindset. Just some of the stuff that notes that I took myself, you know, show me the incentive and I will show you the outcome. And this is something that Patty said around, you know, if we really want to make change in society, if we really expect people to try and be more healthy, to try and improve their own health, then we have to incentivize people. And I think he is totally spot on there. But what is actually happening right now is we've went the other direction. And what we're doing is we're incentivizing people to create uh, what I would say terrible environments, i.e. i.e. fast food restaurants, fast food takeaways. And we are incenting, incentivizing those business owners, those entrepreneurs, those franchises to basically create environments which is incredibly unhealthy and bad for our health. And enough said on that, but we know, we know these establishments. We know where they are. They're absolutely everywhere. And for me personally, it's, it's, it's something, just because I'm always conscious of my health every single day, I'm trying to do some kind of exercise, I'm worried about my health, I'm worried about my body, my, my neurological symptoms come and go. Thankfully, in the last couple of years, they've, they've, they've went more than came and, and things are very much under control. But I'm still incredibly aware of my body and my health. And I find it easier to be in this conscious state, whereas a lot of my friends and family and others um, if they're maybe doing okay, then it's not right maybe at the top of their priorities. And one of the things they try and do in the podcast is try and encourage people to think about these kinds of subject matters. But also some of my notes that it may not be your fault, but it is your problem. And that was another a real spark from, from Patty. It's not your fault, but it is your problem. And again, that's about taking personal responsibility. It's about taking back control. It's about having conversations, real conversations with yourself 
honest conversations with yourself around your own health, how you want to improve it. Do you want to improve it? Do you really? Do you actually want to become fitter, healthier, uh, stronger? And if you really do and, and you have that conversation with yourself and you decide, you draw a line in the sand, you decide that you do want to uh, improve, you do want to feel better, you're fed up with feeling tired and stressed and no energy and all of that, well then, what are you going to do about it? And I thought that was brilliant from Patty. It's maybe not your fault, but it is your problem. He kept talking about how important it is to change your environment, you know, change the environment in the home, in the workplace, back to a change of policy where government really have a role and to stop incentivizing bad behavior, but to incentivize really good behavior. The other catchy line I thought, physiology doesn't care about your schedule. So how many people do you know, or maybe this is you, where you're going, I, I can't go to the gym or I can't go for a walk or I can't go for a swim or I can't go up that mountain. I've just got too much on. I'm really busy with the kids and the family. Everybody, everybody talks like that. Everybody comes up with every single excuse not to do stuff that will actually help you get fitter, healthier, healthier and stronger. It's the human brain. We always, it always defaults to the easier, easier outcome for you. So look, lots of stuff in that. That was episode number 50 of the podcast. Really pleased that um, I got to the half century talking about health and something I'm really, really passionate about. If you want to speak to me or reach out to me, Connor at connordevine.com. I don't know where you're listening to this podcast, but if you are and you thought it was of value, maybe you'll share it with a friend. If you get a minute, you might leave me a review. So look, that's been really good. It was coming up to Christmas time. I wanted to get five episodes produced. Uh, big thanks to uh, my new producer, uh, Evan, who's pulled off um, and produced five amazing episodes. We've done it slightly differently uh, in, episode, in series four of the podcast. I've got a professional producer. I've upped my game because I'm obviously trying to improve the product for you guys who are listening to this. So I hope you have noticed the increase in value there as well. So look, that's all for me. I just want to wish everyone a happy Christmas. Um, look after yourselves. Look after each other. Get your goals done for next year and keep the faith.